Watch the race to the governor's office debate tonight at 7 p.m. on KHI and 9 p.m. on KHON2, your local election headquarters. Sponsored by AARP Hawaii. Race to the governor's office debate is brought to you by AARP Hawaii. For tonight's debate featuring the major candidates for governor and their running mates for lieutenant governor. It's a unique opportunity to learn more about the tickets for both the Republican and the Democratic parties. I'm Gina Mangieri. We will get right to the governor's portion of the debate in just a moment. But first, a look at the format. The questions come from our viewers and our newsroom and the candidates themselves. Candidates will have one minute, 15 seconds to answer the questions. There may also be follow-up questions. And if so, the candidates will be given 30 seconds apiece. At the conclusion of the forum, each candidate will have at the same time for closing remarks. I will be ensuring that the candidates remain within the time limits. The candidates will see a yellow light when there are 15 seconds left and a red light when time has expired. They are allowed to finish their sentence. Well, the first round of questions is for our candidates for governor, Mr. Josh Green and Mr. Duke Iona. Thank you both for being here. Thank you. Well, the order for the questions was decided in advance with a coin flip. Mr. Iona, you'll answer this one first. Okay. We want to start by discussing the economy. After COVID and now the recession on the U.S. mainland, Hawaii's economy is recovering, but not not as quickly as some as it expected. What specific policies do you plan that would help residents deal with the challenges posed by a weak economy? You Ms. Crayona. You know, Gina, this is something that has been resonating throughout the state. Everywhere we go, it's about, okay, what's your what's your grocery bill? How much are you paying at the uh, at the gas station? And you know, I hate to say it, but a lot of people are saying, well, we're giving up, we're gonna move out. So for us, at least from our administration, I think the best thing we can do is just kind of get out of the way. Let businesses know that they can be businesses. Try to see how much uh, we can uh, do with regulations and taxes. And really be able to open up that sign again, hold up that sign again that Governor Lingle did when she got elected, which is Hawaii is open for business. I mean, that's the best we can do in regards to helping our businesses out, especially our small businesses. It's so, so such a a tragic demise during the uh, the COVID um, period. And a lot of them haven't recovered. Some have, and they're very gingerly making their way back. So I, I believe that's all we can do uh, besides, you know, helping them with policies if we can, hoping that we don't uh, in, infer any more burdens on them regarding taxes and, you know, regulations. And once again, I'm repeating myself, but it's, it's that obvious in regards to how can we let businesses flourish. Thank you. Mr. Green. Thank you, uh, Gina. I'd like to be a little more proactive than that. When COVID hit and we had to close the state, it was devastating. I was honored to help rebuild our economy with the Safe Travels program, which brought about 85% of our travelers back. That uh, was an existential moment for us, so we were able to survive. But we do have to take deliberate action as we go forward. We can't sit back and wait. I'd like to get rid of the tax on food and medication to lower the cost of living for our people. I'd like to put incentives to develop new industries like agriculture. We have to have other industries uh, in addition to ag. It, uh, we need green energy programs so that the next time a crisis hits and we lose many of our tourists that we won't be so prone. Uh, beyond that, if I'm chosen, I will immediately go to Japan and ask uh, for extra support from Japan's travelers to come back to Hawaii. Japan represents 15% of our travelers historically, but 30% of our economy. And that is very important for us as a people. So there's a lot of proactive things I think we need to do. I also do agree we should get rid of um, some of the regulation on small businesses, on businesses under 50, uh, so they can flourish. All of these things are necessary from our administration. Thank you. And you addressed this, but this was actually a viewer question as well. I'll give you time to respond to it as well and you sir several viewers actually asked if you would reduce the taxes on food and medicine to help residents cope with inflation and i may add in there what would you replace the revenue with if you did because that's a huge chunk of our state revenue well well absolutely we've been we've been uh, pro uh when we got elected in 2002 and prior to that i know the republicans have always been a proponent of uh, eliminating that tax and absolutely would get rid of that tax but there's really when you look at what we can do better i mean really what we we don't focus on uh -huh. and and again this is because of one party dominance and you know the fact that we have a, a democrat um a legislature and democrats 
Democrats in the executive office, we don't look on the spending side. There's enough money out there as far as I'm concerned, you know. It's a matter of looking on the spending side and how we can be more efficient in what we're spending our money on. And accordingly, we can uh, prioritize, obviously, is another thing we need to prioritize. And let's not forget that we just had a huge influx of money from the federal government. Whether we agree with that or we don't, that's not the issue right now. What we need to do is make an assessment of that. So I'm, I'm all about auditing that, seeing where all of that money is right now, because I believe there's still some money out there where it's gone. I mean, we have provisions such as the $600 million that are going to go to uh, Hawaiian homes that if they don't spend it within three years, it comes back into the general fund. We need to do a better job. Thank you. And in your proposal to eliminate the, the food and, and tax uh, medicine tax as well, would you replace that sp money in the, bu the state budget or go without? Well, two ideas come to mind right off the bat. First and foremost, I proposed what I think is the most dynamic change to how we bring money into the state, which is a climate impact fee. Travelers that come to Hawaii should pay a $50 fee if they're adults. That fee would go into a special fund to deal with the many shortfalls that we have in dealing with our climate crisis. That could bring between 350 and $400 million, according to UHERO, into our our economy from travelers to help with the impacts of the really large burden that they often put on our land and on our economy. In addition to that, we have to review some of the areas where we do spend a lot. As you know, I've been very focused on homelessness and, and health care, where there's high utilization from a very small group of people. In Hawaii, 3.6 percent of our population that are on Medicaid consume about 61 percent of our Medicaid budget. To give perspective, that's about 13,000 people have historically been consuming about $1.2 billion because they don't have the greatest system. So as we improve that system, without a doubt, we can save 40 to 45 percent, which brings hundreds of millions of dollars back into to our coffers to do the many things that we have to do to support small business, to do new programs like pre-K education, which uh, Sylvia, Luke, and I propose we do for all the people of Hawaii. We will reshape government, but we'll do it compassionately. Thank you. Well, Hawaii continually ranks among the worst states for businesses and the rising costs and low unemployment. Well, those are making things worse. How can your policies help prevent more local businesses from having to close their doors? Mr. Green. Well, one thing that we can do, and we should do, uh, and we learn these lessons going forward, is when there's a crisis like COVID, which in truth, we did come through better than any other state with the lowest mortality rate, lowest um, infection rate in the country because people sacrifice so much. But when we close businesses and we close the state, we should have made them completely whole with support for their leases. That kind of thing has to be done going forward. You learn these lessons when you go through a new crisis, a pandemic, and that's actually hardened me uh, and seasoned me to be governor if the people will choose me. But there's many things we should do. I do think we should decrease some of the regulations on small businesses because they become onerous, having to do certain things year after year after year. As a physician, I've also been a small business owner, and I've seen that in person. I was also the medical director of the Hawaii Independent Physician Association, and each and every one of those practices are a small business. There are ways that we can change the tax structure in some ways for them. Like was mentioned earlier, if we get rid of some of the taxes, the general excise tax on medicine and health care, that will help us deal with our health care shortage, our physician shortage. Those are all small businesses, and they resonate across the state because health is a large part of our economy. Mr. Iona. You know, I, I, um, uh, I just heard the... Uh, the Lieutenant Governor state that um, we came out of COVID as the best we could be, and, and that's not true. Um, when, when the policies were enacted in regards to our, our pandemic, um, I think a lot of things needed to be considered, and what wasn't considered was the impact that it was going to have on our small businesses and our economy. And we know right now, and of course hindsight is 2020, but I believe there was enough information when policies were being were being created and, and implemented that we didn't have to have a full closure of our economy. And that hurt us tremendously. And so now we're paying the price. And, and government just doesn't have the funds. I, I beg to differ that the economy is going to come back as quickly as, uh, as some economists are saying. And so as a result of that, again, as mentioned earlier, we just have to get out of the way. We have to make sure that we can look at the regular in fact, maybe it's a good time not to reset in regards to our GET tax and see whether or not we should adopt a sales tax. Well, we know that the exemptions, the, the tax exemptions, should be applying to our medical doctors because that's one of the reasons why a lot of doctors are leaving us. Yeah, comment about the uh, COVID preparation, just very briefly. Uh, the reason we had to take action was because we knew that we were going to see about 4,400 to 4,500 people die each year if we didn't take direct action. And so the calculation was an incredibly difficult one. Sierra Kupuna Parish, they had about an 8,000 times higher likelihood of dying if they contracted COVID uh, versus others if they were younger. And so action had to be taken. And I was very grateful to work with our healthcare heroes to make sure that happened. But there always are consequences of decisions.
Thank you. And Mr. Ayon, about 25 yeah, seconds a, to respond to that. That was a huge consequence that we paid, and we know now that that didn't have to be done. I don't want to I don't want to keep arguing the point, but uh, it's evident right now, and as a result of that, we have, again, we have businesses that have closed that will not be coming back. We have people who have left the state because they can't find employment here or they can't find similar employment, and we wonder why we have this, you know, this out-migration, which we shouldn't have of local people. Thank you. Hawaii is also very reliant on tourism, and with travel shut down during the pandemic, it's severely impacted our economy. So can you share with us some concrete plans that you have to help diversify our economy so it's not so so reliant only on tourism? You, Mr. Iona. You know, this may be one of the areas where we agree on. Uh, we need, you know, but obviously I, 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 I question the, the timing of it. We've been talking about diversifying our economy for the longest time, and it just hasn't been done. I know back when we were, uh, when we were in office in 2002 and 2004, you know, we kept emphasizing the fact that we needed to play to our strengths. And part of our strengths is obviously our, our surrounding um, marine area. And so we need to be much better at that. I always said that astronomy was a big part of it. I was a, I was a big advocate along with another Democrat in regards to space travel. I believe that that would have been something that would have been tremendously helpful for us. When it comes to tourism, that will be our main economy. There's no doubt about it. But as mentioned by many, and I think we're on the right path right now, we need to manage it better. And of course, you know, my, um, my opponent said, well, we'll have an impact fee. Well, you know, I, I, I question that also, the wisdom of that in regards to what our tourists are going through right now. Not only do they have, you know, user fees and they have resort fees, but they got a new GET tax now. And they can only pay so much. And they've been talking about it. And I'm, I'm afraid that they're going to start voting with their feet and they're going to be walking away from Hawaii. Or we're not, we're not going to have the type of visitors that we want. But more importantly, we're just going to lose visitors in droves. Mr. Green. Thank you. Uh, so to diversify our economy, there's several things we should do. We should put extra support into both modern and uh, historic agriculture. And what I mean by that is we can grow food here, we can be sustainable, and we can make it actually lucrative as we look to new industries, whether it be hemp, uh, marijuana is something that people have proposed as an ag industry. I think we should be growing all the vegetables that we need here, but we do it in a water conservation way. You can use 90% less water with new ag, and that's where you bring uh, greenhouses together into uh, the great science of agriculture. Also, agriculture should be, in a way, uh, supportive of our culture. So we go back to the old ways, and we do fish ponds, and we make that culturally appropriate and incorporate that into tourism. I believe health tourism would be very significant here. We could bring billions of dollars of health tourism here because people from both east and west would love to come to Hawaii. And a partnership with a major modern university sounds like a plan for me. The, the tax that I have talked about, the impact fee, has already been tested and proven that it will not decrease a lot of uh, travelers because we had a $120 test that people had to get coming into Hawaii to protect our kupuna and protect people, and we still saw the restoration of our travelers. Finally, I'd like to see film expand in our state and tech expand in our state. I do think that there have been novel ways to put tax credits into place that will bring new industries, but we have to do it because we can't rely just on tourism and the military. Can I, can I respond to that? Yes, please. Yeah, sure. I, I, I agree with his last statement in regards to the, uh, the, the film industry. Um, I'd like to add one thing, and, and the other thing is about, I don't know how that was a test uh, of the impact fee when you're talking about the, the restrictions during COVID, but I want to add this. I've talked about this when I was in, uh, when I was in office as an LG, and that is a sports commission. And now it's not going to be an, uh, a substitution or an, it's a, an industry all, all in and of itself, but I think it will bring in tremendous revenue uh, to the state of Hawaii if done correctly. Thank you. And is Mr. Green, about another uh, 25 seconds there. The one thing we didn't get to mention was our university system. Mm -hmm. The university system is an incredible incubator for growth. And I think that we have to recommit ourselves to the university research and development. I've toured the university and their labs many times, and I think there are billions and billions of dollars of companies that can develop out of there. So that'll be another priority for our team. And Mr. Green, you mentioned marijuana briefly for each of you. Do you support or oppose the legalization of recreational marijuana, Mr. Green? If done safely and sent to me by the legislature, I will sign that bill. I think the people already have moved past that uh, culturally as a concern, but here's what I would do. First of all, if marijuana is legalized, it should be very carefully monitored and only done like cigarettes are. I've been very um, careful to regulate tobacco over the years. We should take the 30 to $40 million of taxes we would get from that, invest in the, in the development and recreation of our mental health care system for the good of all. That's where you have to go with this kind of problem. Thank you, about 20 seconds. I am surprised that, uh, that 
my opponent says that he's in favor of legalizing marijuana. By the way, I have an issue with recreational marijuana, but that's for another another question, another time. But but I'm, I'm surprised because of his of his, the fact that he's a doctor and and the effect in particular that um, marijuana has on our young adults and our young children. I mean, it's, it's, I think there's a lot of studies out there. I got some anecdote, uh, anecdotal uh, evidence in regards to how it affects the toxicity, uh, affects the brain development of our young people, and, and that's a major concern that I've always had since I started drug court. I should mention, uh, because he mentioned my position, that I don't support marijuana for people under 21 before their neurologic development occurs, but the use of marijuana for chronic pain, uh, for PTSD, for spasm, for anxiety has been very important, and the reason I, I do support this, though I've always wrestled with this issue, is because the impact of opioids, the opioid epidemic, and people turning to other drugs which are far worse, like methamphetamine, is something that we should avoid. And I do believe that this will curb some of those needs to go and get those street medications and street drugs. Thank you, about 20 seconds yes, on that. Yes, I, I, don't, I don't believe in substituting drugs. I don't think you use another drug for, for, uh, for whatever the ailment may be. But in regards to, um, you know, Medicinal marijuana, I mean, I think that's great. And we have a program going on right now. We can do better with that. We should do better with that. And so I'm, I'm not opposed to that. But again, we're talking about legalizing marijuana, which is just another drug that's going to go out there and cause more havoc within our community. And we just don't need that at this point in time. Thank you. Hawaii's high housing costs is something that each of you has promised to tackle. Tell us about your specific plans and how they would help all residents, both owners and renters. Uh, Mr. Green. Okay, so it's a complicated and huge issue. It is the most important issue we face right now. We have to build thousands and thousands of units to keep our kids home. We have a 15-year-old in our household and a 10-year-old, 11-year-old, forgive me, Sam, and we are looking forward to them coming back home. We will build 10,000 units in our first term. We have to do what we can to get rid of the red tape. I'll use executive orders if I have to to do that immediately. In addition to that, I'm very proud of my Lieutenant Governor nominee, Sylvia Luke. She's terrific. She brought us $600 million to the table for Department of Hawaiian Homelands. That's another three thousand units that are possible. We need to crack down on illegal Airbnbs, which are terrible. There are thousands and thousands of them taking up the inventory that our people have. And then finally, vacant uh, houses where people have speculated uh, is unacceptable. We should tax those much more highly so that when people have vacant units, those go back into the inventory for our people. All of these things have to be done together. And finally, we're going to have to take on the water challenges that we have now from Red Hill, because without water, it will be difficult to develop. But I can tell you, I will use, once, I, once again, I will use emergency powers if I can't come to agreement with the legislature, which I expect I will, to do all of these programs. Everything that's mentioned by my opponent are nothing but the symptoms of the problem. We need to attack what the problem is, and, and this is something that, you know, this legislature and the executive branches uh, in the last 12 years have failed to do. And the solution to this is really looking at the real estate market and focusing upon the local market. It really is that simple. And in addition to that, what really makes it sustainable over the years is tying real estate, local real estate, to people's income. On top of that, we jumpstart that with the Hawaiian Homes Program, and I'm grateful also for the $600 million that's been appropriated, but it has to be done correctly, and it has to be done effectively, so that we can jumpstart it with the 28,000 people are on the, the waiting list right now, and what we have to do, and this is, this is absolutely essential uh, to unlocking um, the power that we have at Hawaiian Homes, because you keep it local, it's a local market, it's restrictive to local people, and in addition to that, when we unlock the value of the lease, which right now is valueless, we afford our beneficiaries who are awarded leases, not only to get the keys, but now to improve upon what they have, those that are on the leases already, to improve what they have, and to afford uh, financial stability uh, to those who have gotten the leases. Well, this, is a, this is a challenge, uh, Gina, because uh, yes, the DHHL program will develop about 3,000 houses if we do a great job, but that's just a fraction of what we need. And it was um, confusing to our team because when we read uh, the Iona plan, it didn't really build very many houses. And we all know that we have a housing inventory shortage that's as much as 70,000 units. Now, the good news is we've already 
already got 70,000 units that have been entitled. And so through executive orders and through good private partnerships, I think we can build those houses. We have to build them along the rail. We have to build DHHL. But if no one's talking about building houses, we've got a big problem. Thank you. 30 seconds. Uh, to the contrary, in regards to putting numbers up there, you just don't put numbers up there and make it a hope and a wish that you're going to build 10,000. Very strategic. Our Hawaii homeownership solution is just that. It's a solution. It's not a program. It's not a plan. It's going to solve the problem that we have. We convert rentals to tenant-owned buildings. We take what we have right now and we make it more specific for our local economy. We drive the outside influences away by having more focus on our local community on a local market and we tie it to income. That's the way we build out of it. This is the way that we're going to sustain it now and into the future. Thank you. With the Supreme Court ruling on Roe versus Wade, abortion rights are in flux in many states. Can you address any changes that you would support to either protect or restrict abortion rights in Hawaii? Mr. Iona. You know, this is, again, this is an issue that my opponent keeps harping on and it's really from my perspective um, to divide and to create um, emotional um, uh, scars for the women of Hawaii. The Supreme Court ruling did nothing to change our laws in regards to abortion. And the only way our laws in Hawaii will be changed is if the legislature puts forth legislation that will amend it either way, to make it more restrictive or to make it more liberal. Our laws, I don't know when the last time it was, uh, it was amended or it was changed in any way um, in regards to our abortion rights, but I know that it's been quite, quite a while. And as far as the state of the, uh, of the law is right now, a woman has a right to choose whether she wants an abortion or she doesn't want an abortion. And so we just need to put this aside, focus on what we need right now. We don't need any more division. We don't need any more emotional uh, turmoil in regards to where we are as a state. We got enough of that. Let's concentrate on it our housing, this co concentrating on our cost of living, and what's reared its ugly head right now is crime in particular, and we need to concentrate on that. Let me ask you, though, sir, about sure. that portion of the question is what you would support. Yes, we understand the legislature makes laws, but they come to the governor for signature. If the legislature puts forth legislation that liberalizes abortion rights further in Hawaii, and if you were governor, would you veto it that? It would all depend on what it is, Gina. I, I can't speculate to say what the legislature is going to do either way. If it's to liberalize, liberalize it more to where now we can have abortion after birth, absolutely. Now you're saying oh, you're going extreme on that. Well, but some states have done it. I don't know if that's what they're going to put forward. I don't know what they would make, what adjustments they would make right now to our laws because they seem perfectly fine with it for the last, what is it, 50 years when it was first enacted in 1973. So I'm not going to speculate on that. Oh, so many things to share. First of all, uh, it is offensive. It is offensive that Duke would twice use the word emotional when we talk about the impact on women and their right to choose whatever health care access they want. It is the prerogative of the governor to protect women's rights. It is as half of our population. It is people we love. There is no, no question that we haven't uh, taken any rights away from women because I've been the health chairperson for the better part of 14 years when I was a legislator and we would never ever take those rights away. Now why is this an issue and not just an emotional challenge for women as was described by my opponent here, which again I think is a terrible thing to say about women and how they feel about this, because the governor will next appoint three justices to the Supreme Court, including the Chief Justice in the next four years. The governor will put in the Director of Health into their administration and that director of health will determine whether or not we support clinics that provide abortions or other contraception or what have you. That person will be central to the process. The attorney general will have to fight off laws from states that put in draconian restrictions on a woman's right to choose. And finally, he made comment about ab abortion after birth. I don't even know what he is talking about. States are not doing that. We're going to protect people's lives. But finally, and I have a little extra time, I hope, he has repeatedly in the past answered questions where he does not believe a woman has a right to choose, even if she's been raped, even if she has been victim of incest, even if her life is in jeopardy. And that is completely out of step with the people of Hawaii, particularly the women of Hawaii. And that is why the governor is important on this matter. Would you like to clarify sure. your position on rape and incest in particular? Oh, no, I'm going to clarify mine first and foremost about his comment about being emotional. It's emotional because, Josh, you just don't get it. There are women out there who believe in the right of life. 
And there are women out there who believe in the right to choice. That's very emotional for them. And they be, you know, this, this argument about we're going to restrict you or not restrict you is very emotional to them. And that has to be respected by, by everyone. It doesn't seem like you're respecting the people who believe in the right to life. And, and that's very, very disturbing. I've, I've heard many women say that to me. So I just want to make that perfectly clear. What about your position on rape and incest, she asked. Oh, no problem with that. When that comes to me at that point in time, if it ever comes to me at that point in time, we'll make a decision on that. Do you support I it? respect the people's choice, and it will be reflected in the legislation that's put forth to me. The legislators will determine that, and we will act accordingly. Let me say something about the justices also. I think it's my turn. He's you're, gone way you're over. Taking, you're, you're putting the cart before the horse when it comes to justices, Josh. Do you think they're not going to retire the at age 70? You know the process. The process is the legislature will enact first, and then if it's challenged, it goes to the courts. The courts don't legislate. So, come on, basic civics. And back to uh, Mr. Green for your, your rebuttal to some of those remarks. Yes, several well, things. Okay, seconds. basic civics. Uh, Mr. Iona has said repeatedly that he doesn't think this is an issue and the governor doesn't have an impact. Well, obviously, basic civics. You put the director of health and the attorney general and the justices in the Supreme Court. It's the same nonsense that we heard from Donald Trump, who you supported, and we'll talk about that, I'm sure, later. Donald Trump said he was not going to get involved in that. You wrote a letter to ask Donald Trump to go to the right of women's reproductive rights. And then what did he do? He, as the executive of our country, put Supreme Court justices into a place where they reversed Roe versus Wade, and that has caused an emotional disaster for people who feel they should control their own bodies. And let me say this to the women out there who are pro-choice. I absolutely respect you as your lieutenant governor, potentially as your governor, and as a physician. I would never ask anyone to do anything they didn't want to do with their body, but I would never restrict someone else from the choices they want to make for themselves. I'm afraid that uh, Mr. Iona is not in step with the people of Hawaii on this matter. And thank you both. With that, we have a very short break. When we return, we'll join Christine Ueno with the candidates for Lieutenant Governor. Do stay with us. AARP Hawaii is proud to sponsor tonight's gubernatorial debate. We are committed to providing you the information you need to vote. Older voters will decide the 2022 election. We are Hawaii's most powerful voters and candidates must pay attention to issues kupuna care about. Candidates who win should know that AARP will fight to make sure that candidates keep their promises. Thank you in advance for voting and mahalo for watching tonight's debate. Welcome back. I'm Christine Ueno here with the gubernatorial running mates, Democrat Sylvia Luke and Republican Junior Tupai. Thank you both so much for being here tonight. Thank, Thank you. you. Now, for this portion of tonight's debate, I will ask the candidates the same questions and they will each have one minute to answer. Are you both ready? Yes, yeah. ma'am. All right, let's go with the first question. In your role as lieutenant governor, how do you see yourself working together with the governor, even in times when you disagree? Mrs. Luke, you'll answer first. Uh, you know, um, since the election, since the primary election, you know, Josh and I um, talk pretty much almost every day. And, you know, because our uh, values and um, politics and policies are aligned, uh, we are already talking about how we're going to solve many issues, including homeless, including housing, including some of the uh, really bold initiatives that I helped pass. Um, Josh mentioned the $600 million for Hawaiian homelands, $300 million for affordable housing, $200 million for preschool expansion. These are things that we're excited to work together to help the people of Hawaii. All right, Mr. Tupai. You know, it's been a pleasure uh, going around with Duke and just uh, learning a lot of different things within the state, even going out to Kauai, Maui, Big Island, and seeing the people out there and just listening to them and just seeing just the political acumen and just the uh, the leadership that he possesses to bring to the state. You know, as far as working together, the leadership style, we've been very collaborative. We meet every day, we go out on the road, and uh, just to see the people out there and to see that our messages resonate with them, it's been exciting to see that, yes. Okay. Next question, what skills do you have that you believe set you apart from your opponent and put you in a better position for the job? Mr. Tupai, you first. Yes, ma'am. Uh, you know, me as a, for, as a former coach for Hilo High School, coaching football, also um, as far as a, a pastor or as a, an instructor with Hawaii National Guard Youth Challenge Academy or lieutenant governor, these are all areas of service. And the, the silver lining is that 
it's serving the people. So whether as a coach, as an instructor, as a pastor, lieutenant governor, these are just titles that show the jurisdiction that I serve. And in the end, I'm not a politician, but I consider myself a statesman. And a politician only says what needs to be done for the next election. A statesman says, and they think about the next generation. And for me, it's to serve the people fight, to hold a bigger broom, a bigger shovel, just to serve more people. Okay, Mrs. Luke? You know, I have to say that um, uh, Coach um, Tupai did a really great job at Hilo High School. Hilo High School has um, done such a terrific job um, raising many of the uh, uh, the values and integrity of many of the kids. And one of our colleagues, Chris Todd, is also a coach at Hilo High. Uh, as far as my skill set, you know, as you know, I've been finance chair for 10 years. And through that, you know, we, I personally know how government works. And I know where some of the deficiencies are, some of the challenges are. And over the last 10 years, I've been pretty, I've been very instrumental in bringing the state to where it is today, which is um, saving up resources which was really instrumental during the pandemic, uh, fighting off many of the issues that we need to do. So I'm ready to work with Josh and we're very excited, but you know, great work with Hilo. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, next question. What issue would you like to take charge of in your role as Lieutenant Governor? Mrs. Luke, you first. You know, this is where I give so much credit to Josh because we have never had a governor at this stage or to be governor, um, at this stage to discuss with a lieutenant governor candidate about some of the issues that uh, he's willing to allow the lieutenant governor to tack on, um, tack on tackle and so in this situation you know we he knows I'm very passionate about expanding preschools 50% of our preschool kids three and four year olds don't have access to early learning can you imagine if we're able to solve this issue in the next five, 10 years, we can lift up, uplift the next generation of our population. And this is something that I'm very excited about. And, you know, Josh, um, Josh and I discuss this issue all the time and he is allowing me to tackle this issue. And I'm just so thankful to him because, uh, you know, we have never seen a gubernatorial candidate willing to share responsibility in that way with a lieutenant governor candidate. Okay, Mr. Tupai. Yeah, um, actually Duke and I discussed this and it's something with my heart as far as for youth, a uh, very similar demographic. And just to reach out, especially to a lot of the young men that are coming in to adolescence, you know, we see a lot of absentee uh, fatherhood, even within the families and we feel like that's what's missing. And somehow creating programs or different uh, options for the young men and to where I can reach into them, you know, and help, you know, whether uh, mentor or whatnot. Because part of that is just, with the whole fatherlessness in our state. And the other, I guess, aspect of that is the missing, the aloha that is within the families. And I think bringing fathers back in, bringing the children back in, especially the young men, whether my time with you challenge working with, you know, 16, 18 year old high school dropouts, uh, drug dealers, gangbanger types, and to, that really pulls my heartstrings. And Duke said, you know what, run with it, yeah. Okay, and the final question, if the voters do not choose your party to lead our state, what would you do to continue to serve the people and advance the initiatives you have planned? Mr. Tupai. You know, we're all for the rule of law and whatever the people decided to do in 33 days on November 8th, you know, we respect that. Um, but I'll definitely, as a you know, current pastor, I'll still be helping the community that it doesn't matter if I have a title or not, but the objective is to serve and to perpetuate, you know, life here in Hawaii. Okay, Mrs. Luke. You know, after a really tough primary election, I'm just so, so thankful to the people of Hawaii for um, uh, giving me this opportunity to be uh, the lieutenant governor ticket on the uh, Democratic side. Uh, regardless of whether we are successful or not, um, you know, we will continue to help the people of Hawaii because this is what's important. And, uh, you know, I look forward to uh, working with Josh on resolving many of the issues in the state, uh, you know, including the cost of living, um, homeless, housing issues. So we're very excited and, you know, we hope that the, the state and the people give us the chance to lead. All right. Well, that brings us to the end of this segment with the Lieutenant Governor candidates. I want to thank you both so much for being here tonight. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We'll be right back with Gina Mangieri and the candidates for governor after a short break. Stay with us.
What if politicians walked in our shoes? If they had to worry about paying bills, had to wonder if they could afford their prescription drugs, if they struggled to care for a loved one, if politicians walked in our shoes, they'd fight for what we need. Tell them at aarp.org slash in my shoes. back. We're now joined by AARP volunteer Dan Gardner with some questions from our sponsor. Dan. Congress recently passed the Inflation Reduction Act, which included measures to lower the cost of prescription drugs. If elected, how will you further lower prescription drug prices with state action? Mr. Iona, you're first. You know, I'm, uh, I'm, the legislature did some, uh, uh, had an effort in this. They proposed some legislation that would, uh, one, increase price transparency. They also um, in, uh, um, introduced some legislation that would tie the price of our prescriptions here in Hawaii to those in Canada. And But I'd like to go a little further than that in regards to what we can do with prescription drugs. And one of it is what other states have done in regards to importing prescription drugs from Canada, which is one of the cheapest uh, in, in the, in the, uh, in the world. And so I'd like to do that. I'd also like to follow the lead of other states in which they've created these, um, these commissions or these boards that would monitor the price of prescription drugs and set a ceiling on it. And that would be the ceiling that um, insurance companies would have to uh, use to reimburse uh, uh, customers in regards to prescription drugs. So I'm supportive of uh, whatever other efforts we can take. Uh, I want to work with the legislature in making sure that we have the proper legislation and, of course, to, uh, to ease that burden on our elders in regards to prescri prescription drugs because they are the ones that are most affected by it. Thank you. Mr. Green. Thank you. It's an excellent question. Uh, this, again, is um, a very personal issue for me because as a physician for many uh, years in Hawaii, I've seen the impact on high costs on our seniors, our kupuna. Did you know that only half of the medications that we prescribe get filled, those prescriptions get filled because of cost for seniors. That means a lot of times people never get the care they need for their diabetes, their heart disease, or hypertension. So there's several things that we need to do. I agree with Duke in many ways on this one. We definitely should be importing from Canada. We should be treating patients with much more respect and giving them ceilings on cost. We've done that as a Democratic Party through the Medicare expansion programs. Also, there's a thing called PBMs, and these pharmacy benefit managers have not been doing a good enough job keeping costs down. What they do is they often uh, in, uh, behave in a somewhat predatory way and keep costs high. And though it's meant to reduce the costs, it really has not happened. So we go to Canada to get drugs. We put caps. We support even the big box stores that do $4 prescriptions. And we make sure that providers never have to get prior authorization for a drug that's a little bit more expensive, but that the, um, that the rebates can come to seniors because they should get the best drugs for themselves at a cost that they can actually fill. So all of these things have to be done. And really taking care of our kupuna, keeping them from having severe disease and outcomes is the right thing to do for our people. Thank you. And Dan has another question. What will you do, excuse me, a just passed law creates a Hawaii retirement savings program that must be implemented by the next administration. What will you do to make sure the program is successful and all workers gain access to payroll savings? Mr. Green, you're first. Well, I also appreciate this question because kupuna poverty is a really large crisis. We've seen some of our, our kupuna become homeless uh, because they have not been able to survive on Social Security and end up on the street. So what does the governor need to do? The governor needs to make sure that our DBED director, our Department of Taxation, and all of those individuals that touch our kupuna lives get them a program that is very easy to manage with a lot of support. Our Office of Aging should also be supportive. For all of us, it's hard enough to navigate some of these challenges. These retirement programs can be very difficult. They can also be predatory in some ways. So we should be very supportive of our kupuna as we enact this system. Not everyone's lucky enough to have a, a pension and often Social Security is not enough to survive on. This retirement program is, uh, is I, thought, I thought was a great idea. I got I to gotta admit, I uh, agree with the legislature on this one. The process, though, the dynamics of, uh, of implementing it are going to be very, very, um, how can I put it, sensitive. Uh, there are some time limits to it. So initially what we're going to have to make sure is first and foremost that we identify all of the employees that would be um, 
uh, affected by this because this is an this is an opt-in program instead of an opt-out program, which is what the, I believe AARP was uh, interested in first, and, and that's the, that's the route that they wanted to take. But the legislature went the other way, so we have to identify them first and foremost. Second, we have to make sure that the employers who are a part of this program are also notified that they are part of this because even though this is a state uh, administered program, it's going to take both of them to be on board early so that we can get this implemented. I believe you got about two or three years in which it has to be fully implemented. So this is a, a great program, uh, as mentioned, for the for those who are young and sometimes just don't think about retirement. And then when they get to that age, it's like all of a sudden, well, I don't have a I don't have a 401k, I don't have a contributory um, you know retirement plan, and what am I going to do? Yes, Social Security is not something that you should be relying upon when you retire. Thank you. All right, we thank Dan and the AARP for providing those insightful questions. It is now time for the candidates to question each other. The candidate will have 20 seconds to ask their question. The opponents will have one minute and 15 seconds to respond. Mr. Iona has the first question. I'd like you to uh, tell me which, which parts of this you agree to and which parts you don't agree to. Very disappointed for Vicky, very proud of how she handled defeat. Classy, but having been married to her for 25 years, I wasn't surprised. As for Green, I can't bring myself to congratulate him. I've done a lot of research on his past. I know that he is not a moral man. Frankly, if Sylvia Luke had not won, I'd be voting GOP for the first time in my life. I disagree with many of Duke Iona's beliefs, but he's a decent, moral man of good character. Thanks again, my friends, Ben Cayetano, and that was posted on his Facebook page on August 14th, 2022. Again, the question is, what parts of this do you agree with? What parts don't you agree with and why? Well, thank you for the question, Duke. Uh, you know what, I have a lot of respect for uh, Governor Cayetano, all of our governors. In the heat of battle, I think spouses often feel very personally about these elections. I was able to see and talk to Mrs. Cayetano after the election. When Ben became sick uh, that night and then the following days, I immediately reached out, uh, not for political purposes to get her endorsement, but to wish him well so that he healed. Uh, I know that at home, it's been difficult sometimes on Jamie when there were a lot of personal attacks. Uh, there were uh, super PACs causing smear campaigns against people, including against me uh, from some campaigns, and it hurts the spouses and they feel it. Uh, look, if, if, uh, if uh, former Governor Cayetano is going to vote for us because of my extraordinary lieutenant governor, I certainly agree with that. That is terrific. And I constantly want to wish the Cayetanos well because she worked very hard in this campaign. She's been a very successful business person, and a lot of the work that Mr. Cayetano did uh, as governor was important to the people of Hawaii. Mr. Green, your question. Um, so, uh, Mr. Iona, after being lieutenant governor, uh, you became a lobbyist. You became a lobbyist for the Hawaii Family Advocates, which is the most conservative organization in our state that lobbies the state legislature. I know that. Uh, there's some good people there. I know that, though, because I was a legislator uh, being lobbied and, and pressed on bills. Can you tell us exactly what you were lobbying uh, on their behalf for while you were a lobbyist with Hawaii Family Advocates? Predominantly, my, my biggest concern was with the, uh, with the families. Uh, as you well know, I was a family court judge for, uh, well, about three years as a full-time judge and three years as a part-time judge. And I've always been of the position that we need to be more proactive. We need to be preventive. And when I look at all the social issues that we face, whether it be substance abuse, uh, neglect and abuse, um, domestic violence, a lot of it lies in the, uh, the formation of our families. So I've always been a strong advocate of strengthening our families, whether by education, whether by example, whether by projects. And uh, when I saw the opportunity to be a part of family advocates, that's exactly what I, I wanted to do and what I emphasized uh, all of my time in regards to, um, you know, just making sure that families are understanding what the dynamics of it all is. It doesn't have to be generational. I saw a lot of generational substance abuse. I saw a lot of ge generational um, um, uh, physical abuse, uh, emotional abuse. Um, you know, and, and this is something, again, that I, it's near and dear to my heart and something that I, uh, I thought was going to be a great opportunity, and it was. Um, and for the time that I was there, my wife and I really put our, our hearts and our souls into it. Thank you. And we now have time to ask each other another question. Uh, Mr. Iona, you can ask first. Sure. When you uh, gave a, a speech recently at uh, Swarthmore College, which is um, 
uh, I believe the, where you graduated from, you stated, and I believe this is a quote, that you speak in front of the entire state all the time. But it's more nerve wracking speaking in front of brilliant people like you. Now many people saw this and they took offense to it, in particular the local people of Hawaii, because they felt that you were talking them down and you did this out of state and you've never said this in front of the people of Hawaii while in state. Can you respond to that? Yeah, I, I do appreciate that. Yeah, the super PAC that the Republican Conservative Coalition has done is taking my words out of context, but let me tell you exactly what I meant. Uh, and so I do appreciate this question for clarification. I was at Swarthmore getting an honorary PhD, which was the honor of a lifetime. Uh, that was in May. What I was saying is I speak in front of people on television like we're doing today, uh, Mr. Iona, and it's not so nerve wracking because I really only have to be in close proximity to you and maybe Gina. But when you're in front of an audience of, in that case, I think it was about 2,000 people, all of whom were getting degrees at that moment, moment of their life, it was nerve wracking because I didn't want to let them down. But I will say this, I'm so proud of our graduates. When our graduates graduate from UH, they have a better future ahead of them. We've done a great job educating them. It really is extraordinary to see how people uh, do so well here and I'm always going to be an advocate for higher education but in that particular case I did want to be very clear that I was just nervous in front of a big group uh, that sometimes happens when you went to a college like that and you were in front of your old professors uh, but when those comments were taken out of, uh, out of context and cut up into pieces, I think everybody should see through that, but I'm really grateful to tell people how much I respect them here in Hawaii uh, here on the stage. Thank you. Can I respond to that? I didn't think we were answering and doing responsible. Well, we could do that. We, we don't have a rebuttal on this particular uh, section for the interest of time and okay. gotten this one. Oh, okay. uh, Mr. Green, your question. Sure. Uh, so, Mr. Iona, in 2016, you supported Donald Trump. You voted for him. You share his values. You had Facebook posts uh, that said that you um, wanted to see uh, people make America great again, his old rhetoric. And in fact, you actually wrote an open letter saying to Mr. Trump, with a lot of other leaders across the country, conservative leaders, that you want him to go further right. You wanted him to further restrict uh, abortion rights. You wanted to make sure he had more conservative judges, which is ultimately what we got in the Supreme Court. Could you explain your support of Donald Trump? Because I don't think many people in Hawaii feel that he shares their values. First and foremost, uh I don't do Facebook, so I don't know how you got that, uh, you, uh, what, what you're saying about a Facebook post, so uh, that, that boggles my mind right now. Uh, secondly, yes, I, I did vote for Donald Trump in 2016. He was the Republican nominee. I would like to add that uh, it was a, uh, a very robust um, caucus. There were about 16 candidates, and my initial support was for Marco Rubio, who didn't quite make it. And so as such, I, I did uh, support the Republican nominee, who ended up to be Donald Trump, uh, simply because of uh, the choices that we had in that election. And in regards to that letter, I recall that it was a part of, um, I believe it was at that time, I was with Fam OA Family Advocates. And it was a letter that, um, in Particularly what I really wanted to be, why I wanted to be a part of it is because of, its, uh, uh, of the support that we had uh, for life, a uh, person's right to life. And that was the emphasis that I placed my support behind of. When it came to judges and the selection of judges, Josh, you know full well as me, that's part of the uh, political process. Uh, the executive branch appoints the judges. You or I will have that opportunity if we are elected. And I think you make no bones about it that if you're elected, you're gonna, you're gonna pull the litmus test just like Joe Biden did. And you're gonna appoint liberal judges who will legislate from the bench and will not construe the, the Constitution as it should be construed. So, you know, that's just part of the political process and that's why we want people uh, to vote accordingly. Thank you. Our time is up on that. Now, Governor Ige recently changed course on the Aloha Stadium project after planning for a mixed-use development. Now the focus is shifting to just building the stadium. Do you agree with this change, and how will you manage this project, Mr. Iona? Before I speak ill on this, because I, I, I just don't have enough knowledge. I don't know what his changes are. I'm like a lot of other people. We're kind of like mesmerized right now. We're shaking our head and scratching our head and going, what is going on? Um, so I, I can't really comment on that. All I can say that the timing is a little suspect. 
you know, he's got about a couple months left in his administration and, and they, you know, they, they pull this. And I, and I really, I use that word very strategically, pull, because that's what it was. It, it was pulling a project that appeared to be done. I mean, it was, uh, RFPs were about to get out and um, I guess a lot of people were involved in it, put a lot of time, they put a lot of money into it, and it was about to launch. And I, I just don't understand it. What my, uh, my perspective on it might be, I think is irrelevant at this point in time. I think I've said it in many other forums in regards to the fact that, you know, I prefer to have an on-campus stadium at the University of Hawaii. However, if I am legally bound by what has already transpired in regards to this administration and where they want to go, I, I will have to follow the law. But um, again, I just don't want to comment on something that would be pure speculation and really might inflame the, the, the situation even more than it needs to be at this point in time. Okay. Mr. Green. Thank you. Uh, this is an important uh, piece of governing right now. What happens at the stadium could help us avert a downturn in the economy. And so I take this very seriously and as I get briefings, I want to make sure that everyone understands my position. No matter, no matter what decision is made in the last uh, month or two of Governor Ige's administration, I intend to make sure that we have housing be a part of our plan for the stadium development. It's very important that we have housing because housing is our largest crisis. There has to be an economic generator there too, and we should expedite the stadium build because if we don't, we could lose our Division I status. If we lose our Division I status, it could jeopardize a lot of our other sports, sports that many women participate in. So we have to make sure that we get this done and get this done in an expedited way. When I was in the legislature, I fought for, for example, the Cancer Research Center to be built. We increased tobacco taxes and we built the Cancer Re Research Center. And in that case, I pushed it along and we did that because of the good work of Michele Carboni and the university folks. We were able to build that 18 to 19 million dollars under budget and six months faster. So I'm gonna push them to build it quickly and have housing be a significant component no matter what decisions are made in the coming weeks. Thank you. Well, how do you plan to bring the often diverse and conflicting forces in the community together if you're elected the governor of all of the people, even those who might have disagreed with you or not voted for you at the time? How will you unite if and when you're governor? Mr. Green. So uniting people and giving them hope is probably the most important thing that a governor can do. Take, for example, the vaccination situation. Now about 85% of those who are eligible, because you have to set aside children who couldn't get the shots, got vaccinated, but that left 15% of people who in their heart believe something differently. There were even protests around, my, protests around my house over the matter, but I did meet with people. I went to Maui, for example, and twice met with people in the community that were very concerned about mandates. So I can bring people together. Sometimes I go on the street and provide street medicine, which brings a very disparate uh, part of our population together. People who have traumatic brain injury, who have drug addiction and mental illness but are homeless, and I'm good at that. I've also always been able to cross the aisle and bring people that are more conservative uh, to my cause because I'm pretty moderate economically. But it really does require someone to reach out in every way. This was controversial, but during the TMT crisis, when there were protests, I went up on the mountain. And I know that that made everyone's eyebrows raise, but I did it after doing an ER shift on Big Island because I was worried about our kupuna. And I will engage as a governor in person to make sure people know that I respect and love them. That's the way Jamie and I handle our job. Thank you. Mr. Iona. Yeah. <clears throat> First and foremost, uh, to bring in any, any forces together, you, you have to have some respect. And the respect gets respect. And that's exactly what's lacking in uh, state government right now, especially in the executive branch. I, I don't know how um, my opponent can talk about bringing people together when he himself and Governor Ige have never gotten together. They've never gotten together as far as I can see uh, in regards to the COVID uh, pandemic that we had. I've never even saw, I've never saw them attend a joint press conference. I've never seen uh, saw Governor Ige once say that any of the policies that he adopted and he implemented were a result of the recommendations that given by, by, um, by his lieutenant governor. But as far as I'm concerned, I have uh, proven myself in regards to my 12 years on the bench and bringing people together. Uh, yeah, albeit I am the authority, but you still need to bring the parties together because in many instances, what you have to do is you have to mediate a case. You have to make sure that they can come to a compromise. And that takes a, a little bit of skill a little bit of wisdom and a little bit of knowledge, which I believe is essential at this point in time. So when we talk about respect, respect gets respect. When we talk about trust, trust is based on respect. And we don't have that right now in government. We're gonna bring that back and we're gonna make sure that the people all know that they have a seat at the table and that we can collaborate. 
briefly in about 15 seconds, will you address your partnership with the governor and then Mr. Iona will ask you your, what your approach would be with your LG? Sure, sure. just a, a quick clarification. I think that those that are out there watching our debate saw me on innumerable occasions speak passionately with the governor by my side. Remember I held those cards up and shared how many people were sick, how many people needed additional health care. I was here on this stage alone several times with governors and mayors, uh, so I don't think that um, the, the former lieutenant governor was really tuned in. I also attended virtually every cabinet meeting and had a speaking space uh, with Governor Ige for these four years. We sometimes disagree, but I hope I made him a stronger governor, and I know that we came through COVID better because of our collaboration. And sir, how would you approach your LG relationship? Well, I, I definitely would hope that um, my uh, my LG nominee, um, Mr. Junior Tupai, has a different attitude than um, the current uh, lieutenant governor, who at that same college and same address said that the LG position is useless. Uh, and he said it's true. Uh, he's tried to make the most of it. And I know that uh, Junior has that, uh, uh, doesn't have that attitude. In fact, uh, I think he's going to be a great LG. Why? Because he's not a politician. He's just somebody who wants to serve. He's been doing that his whole life. And obviously, I'll embrace him the same way that I was embraced by Governor Lingo. Thank you. Thank you. But We're I almost out of time. When we'll he, uh, he says uh, that. Sir, he took that out of context. Never gave me time. He you took never, it out of context. You never gave me time. I, 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 in self-deprecating humor, said that, and I said, Lieutenant Governor is useless unless you make something of it, and already Sylvia Luke is making an extraordinary uh, job of this uh, job that she will, I hope, have based on the uh, decision of our voters. And another 10 seconds yeah, to you, well, sir. Gina, that wasn't taken out of context because he said this many times, not just at his college, but also here locally after the primary election. Well, we are almost out of time. We'll be back with some closing thoughts right after this short break. Good evening and thanks for watching tonight's gubernatorial debate. AARP Hawaii is sponsoring the debate because we are committed to giving you information you need to vote. Your mail ballot should start arriving around October 21st. Go online to elections.hawaii.gov to check if you are registered, to change your address if you moved, or if you don't get your ballot. You can also sign up for the new ballot track service to track your ballot. If you make a mistake on your mail ballot, get a replacement ballot. Don't use whiteout. Also, don't forget to sign your ballot envelope. If there's a problem with your signature, your vote won't be counted unless you correct it in time. To make sure your ballot is returned by election day, mail it at least a week before November 8th or drop it at an official ballot drop box or voter service center. Thank you in advance for voting and mahalo for watching tonight's debate. Welcome back, and now it's time for closing statements. Mr. Iona, you have the first, you have one minute. Let's begin this with the question. How's your gas bill? How's your electric bill? How's your grocery bill? Are you taking things out of the grocery cart because you, you gotta pay for your rent? I mean, these are all the things that we've been hearing as we travel across the state. And it really boils down to this. Do you want the same thing? Do you want the same long-standing issues that we've been talking about? Affordable housing, cost of living. Do you still want that? Well, if you vote for our opponents who have had more than 40 years as legislators, and my opponent here, Josh Green, who's had four years in the executive branch, then that's what's going to happen. Ten years from now, four years from now, you're going to be talking about the same thing. We know one thing. It doesn't have to be this way. It can be better. So we ask that you vote for us. We have the experience. We have the knowledge. We have the wisdom to make sure that we not only have a collaborative um, leadership style, but we bring back aloha. We bring back a, a fixed moral compass. So on behalf of myself and Junior Tapai, we humbly ask for your vote on November 8th. Aloha. Mahalo Gina, KHON, people of Hawaii for welcoming me. More than two decades ago, I came to Kau to be the doctor for a people that didn't have a provider. The National Health Corps brought me here. I got to care for more than 8,000 patients, most of whom were Filipino or Hawaiian. They brought me into their hearts and into their lives. They taught me the meaning of aloha. I saw their struggles with drug addiction and trauma. They didn't have those services, so I ran for the House of Representatives. I was elected and began to work on our challenges. Most importantly, I met my wife about two weeks after being elected, fell in love with her, and we started a family. 
I served in the House, solved problems, served in the Senate then for 10 years, and again solved some of our largest social problems, helped families with children who have autism get coverage, worked on the homeless crisis, which I'll continue to do if I'm your governor. I became lieutenant governor, which is a very valuable place for me to serve as doctor. I took on our COVID crisis. We had the best response, and all of this has been the honor of a lifetime. So I humbly ask you to support me and Sylvia to be your governor and lieutenant governor going forward. Aloha. Thank you. And that brings us to the end of our race to the governor's office debate. We thank all the candidates for joining us. Ballots are going out soon for this all mail in election with results on election day, Tuesday, November 8th, starting about 7 p.m. You can also drop your ballot at one of the voter service centers or uh, or the ballot deposit locations. We're going to have all of that information posted on our website, khon2.com. So stay with KHON2 for all of your election coverage and your results on general election day. Mahalo for watching and aloha.